Welcome to my channel where we cover the lore of Final Fantasy XIV. We cover the stories both big and small, the epic and the cute, the silly and the tragic. I hope you all enjoy the ride and welcome to the Chronicler of Lore. While the Warrior of Light and the Scion saved Novrant from the Light and prevented the Eighth Umbral Calamity, that doesn't mean things are over. The Scions are still stuck on the first, and there is the question that needs to be answered. With the timeline leading to the Exarch's future prevented, why hasn't he disappeared? The only explanation is the world that he came from is now a part of its own timeline, an alternate reality, which means the Exarch won't fade away at all. Which is good, because you all need him to help work on sending the Scions back home. Since they can't go back home, they all head out to catch up with friends they've made on the first, while the Exarch sends you home to report to Tataru and to find out what's been happening there while you were away. A lot's happened. Gaius and Estinian are at the Imperial Palace in Garlemald, and they arrive in time to see Zenos murder his father for the simple crime of putting his fight with you at risk by trying to use Black Rose. The man's gotten his body back since Elidibus ran instead of fighting him, but Gaius seeing the Emperor get murdered attacks Zenos anyway. In the meantime, Elidibus, sensing that Emmett Selk is now dead, leaving him as the only unsundered, he starts to work on a new plan. Seeing how powerful fractured beings like you and Zenos have become makes him wonder about what's going to happen next, especially since Zenos knows the truth about the planet and its shards. Hydaelyn may be winning the war for now, but he plans on having you all killed on the first. Since you're running around claiming to be warriors of darkness, he'll crush you with warriors of light. On the first, Reen senses something out in the empty, and because he's not going to let her go alone, Lankra goes with her to check it out, which leads into the story of Eden which I've covered on this channel in its entirety, so check that out if you're interested. Back on the source, Tataru is happy to see you back safe and sound. She enlisted the help of a friend of yours who we all know as Estenian, and she tried to call him but he hasn't answered the Link Pearl. The Eorzean Alliance says that the fighting at Gimlet Dark has stopped, and the Empire isn't making any moves to attack again, yet which means there'll be some time for a little rest, and time for you to tell Tataru and Flamin everything that happened on the first. Hearing that Menphilia is truly gone is hard for both women, but Flamin is proud of her daughter, and from what she's heard of Reen, the girl will make a good heir, and she wants you to tell her that when you get back to the first. While the three of you talk, Rio shows up to say that he's decided to sneak over the border to see if getting closer to Garlemar will help him get a signal from Estenian. With the fighting being over in Gimlet, it shouldn't be too hard for him to sneak into the nation. He wanted to let Tartaru know that, and that Kral has made it back to the Rising Stones. Kral's been monitoring the health of the unconscious Scions, and there's a problem. Their ether is becoming unstable, and since Thancred's is the worst while the twins are still pretty much okay, the instability is obviously being caused by being on the first for too long. Kral thinks it's a sign of the link between their body and soul fading, so if you don't get them back in their body soon, the Scions will die. Kral doesn't know how long you have, but she and Matoya will keep them alive until you bring them back. Fixing the Scions is easier said than done. The best minds on the source are already working on the problem and haven't gotten anywhere. Kral, however, thinks the cure lies with the Exarch, so she sends you back to the first to let everyone know what's going on and to see if the Exarch has made any progress on the whole saving the Scions thing. Which he hasn't, which is no real surprise. The others, minus Thancred and Reen, show up to hear the news that you brought, and they're not really surprised that their bodies are dying, although their souls seem fine for now. In any case, they really need to figure out a way to get home. When you're trying to solve a problem, the best thing to do is start at the beginning, so the Exarch explains how he brought you to the source in the first place. For starters, it's not his power that he's been using for all of his great feats. He uses large amounts of energy that are stored in the Crystal Tower to power all of his magic. The same goes for the magic he used to summon you. He used the tower to cut a hole in reality that only allows one specific person to travel through. He had made the hole attuned to the Warrior of Light, but he accidentally grabbed the Scions and forced them through it, which is why their souls were torn from their bodies. If you try to squeeze a square peg through a round hole, pieces of the peg will be torn off to make it fit. In this case, the Scions were the peg, and their bodies were the bits torn off to make them fit. He plans on doing everything he can to get you all home, but the one method he thinks will undo the summoning is his death. With the fact that he didn't disappear when the calamity was prevented, 
I don't see how he can think him dying will send you all back, but time travel is almost always dumb. And Alize shows how dumb she thinks it is by casually walking up and flicking the Exarch across the forehead, claiming that he owes you his life and that means he can't die without your permission. That's not exactly how that works, but Alize and the Exarch both practically worship you, so if you told them to do something stupid, they probably would. Ishtola thinks that their time would be better spent studying you since you're the summoning that worked perfectly and you're free to travel between both worlds. And not only did your soul stay intact, you didn't lose your clothes or the stuff that's in your seemingly bottomless pockets. It's a lot like regular teleportation magic. It treats the stuff that you're carrying like it's a part of your body. So if you could put them all in your pocket, technically you should be able to take them to the source. Of course, if that didn't work, they'd be left floating in the rift forever. Now, if they could store their souls in something you have, like some white aurasite, you should be able to take them. And if the aurasite can hold the souls of something as powerful as an Asian, holding them should be simple. That of course means you have to figure out a way to keep their souls safe inside of the aura site, then take them back out once they're on the source. The Exarch actually knows someone who's pretty good at soul manipulation. A Numo friend of his lives in a palace that was abandoned after the flood by the elves who built it. This Numo used to be in an honored position in Vobert's royal court, and was said to be the most knowledgeable person in the world when it came to matters of the soul. The fact that this Numo separated itself from the world means it may not want to help you, and considering the fact that the Exarch tried to get its help with the Sin Eaters a few years ago only to get attacked by its familiars means this is going to go about as poorly as everything else you've tried. But most of the Fae do seem to like you, so this may work in your favor. Or this Numo might try to kill you. Either way, it's worth a try. Oriante decides not to join you on this little mission and instead goes off to craft some white aurasite, so the rest of you head off to the Grand Cosmos. The Exarch expects you all to be attacked the minute you set foot in the place, so instead of trying to sneak in, you all just march in with weapons in hand. Alice thinks that's a terrible way to ask someone for help, but Estola thinks the Numo would be interested in meeting people who could beat its defenses. At least she would if it were her. Plus the Exarch is eager to fight by your side again anyway. And you indeed have to do a lot of fighting inside of the palace because the Numo has a lot of creatures for you to face. Beating its strongest one does make it reveal itself to you and it decides to talk. The Exarch explains to Beck Luke that you all need its help, while throwing in the words that are difficult for Numo to resist like shake and beg. Beck Luke really doesn't want anything to do with humans after his last bad experience with the Vobert mage who turned his only friend into a monster. That's a story that I covered in Tales from the Shadows number 5, and after what happened, I don't blame Beck Luke for separating from mortals. But after you swear that you're only looking for a way to save your friends, Beck Luke agrees to come to the Crystarium as long as you pay. Once the Exarch tells Beck Luke everything, the Numo is amazed to find out that the reason the night sky is back is because of you, a person from an entirely different world. That's not nearly as shocking as the knowledge of other worlds in general. But the fact that the souls of the Scions are far denser than other souls, and they have no bodies, is enough proof to show that the story is not a lie. Beck Luke can see that you do have a body, and your soul is even denser than the others. Since the story was so interesting, the Numo agrees to help you get your friends home. But of course it'll need some help doing his field research, which the Scions have no problem with. Beck Luke immediately starts trying to solve your problem and proves that its knowledge is very useful when it tells you that your souls are too unstable to survive if put in white aurasite. To stay in the form that resembles a real body, the Scion's souls have been steadily absorbing ether. That process would have to be stopped for them to be safely stored in the aurasite, and the ether they absorbed would have to be removed. That will leave their minds to drift unable to interact with anything until they're put back in their bodies. They'd basically become what Arbor was. Their bodies would become mindless husks, similar to the people at Journey's Head who have been being corrupted by Light Aether. Beck Luke hadn't heard about this and wants to see them so he can better understand what Alice is talking about. And the Numo may be able to figure out a way to save the people. While you all head to Journey's Head, Ishtola decides her time would be better spent helping Orianje. I just think she didn't feel like walking around in any more unpleasant locations for a while. We all know black mages don't like to move much, even if they're standing in AOE circles. The Exarch decides to work on the Aura side too, so you, Beck Luke, and the twins head out to Amarang. When you all arrive, Beck Luke immediately sees that Halric's ether is shifted way too far to the light side, and he's on the verge of becoming a Sin Eater. But Alice can see that he's gotten a bit better, which makes Beck Luke think that there may be a chance to save him. If the treatment the Numo has in mind works, that is. 
In one experiment, it had made a potion that could stimulate the body's ether. The potion won't reverse what's going on, but it should do something. For some of the patients, the potion makes them show some signs of improvement, but for the ones as far gone as Halric, it doesn't do anything. Even though restoring the night to the world will make people's ether rebalance naturally over time, that's only for the ether of their physical bodies. The soul is a little harder to heal. Halric might get better eventually, but it could take years, or even decades. Alice doesn't want to give up on him though, and fortunately Beck Luke thinks that there may be something useful to be learned from trying to save the boy. Something that could help with safely sending the Scions home. Beck Luke's next idea is to summon a familiar since they can amplify the ether poured into them, which makes them useful for casting spells that you wouldn't be able to pull off without help. Since Alice doesn't really want to hear a long drawn out explanation on how familiars work, Beck Luke sends you all out to grab some clay, water, and a lantern full of pixie magic, which means it's back to the land of the pixies, something the twins really don't want to do after the little flying monsters played with them the last time. But it has to be done, so while they do that, you head to the miners at Twine to see about that special clay you need. Since you were last there, Chai News has helped the miners with the tallows, which will make things a lot easier for them. It also makes it easier for you to get what you need. With the clay in hand, you get back to Beck Luke, and it seems like the twins are back too, which means the pixies didn't torture them too much this time. With everything you need in hand, Beck Luke gets started on crafting the familiar, but Alice wants to know if she could learn to cast the spell since she did say that she would help the people at Journey's Head, and she feels like it's her responsibility. Her desire to help is something that can actually make the spell stronger, so the new mode thinks she's the perfect person for the job. However, there's one issue. The clay needs to be shaped into a porksy, and she is absolutely horrible at all things art. The sculpture looks absolutely terrible, but it doesn't have to be pretty to do the job. With a little focus and the spell back Luke taught her, Alice summons a porksy that, thankfully, looks nothing like the thing she carved, and it has the energy inside of it to restore Halric's soul, in theory. All it needs now is a name, and then it'll do her bidding. So, in a shout out to Final Fantasy VIII, Alice names her porksy Angelo after Rhinoa's dog, and he gets to work on Halric. As the Porksy pours ether into the boy, he starts to talk and cry, and Beck Luke can see the color of his soul coming back, meaning it's working. It'll still be a while before the boy is fully recovered, and he'll need more treatments, but a road to recovery has been found. But the spell takes a lot out of the caster and the patient, so you can't do it all at once or everyone involved will die. The upside is seeing how a stagnant soul could be reactivated, Beck Luke has an idea of how to make a soul stagnant which is what needs to happen to send the Scions back to the source. But that's not the most important discovery. Alice thinks this treatment could work on curing tempering. Of course, the soul is complex and requires more study, so Alice wants to stay at the end to keep working on improving the treatment, although Beck Luke thinks she should rest. You don't get a chance to try to convince her to sit down because Kaishir comes running up screaming about trouble in Yulmore. Lady Chai is frantic, so of course you and Alphano go to check on the woman. She's so paranoid because Chai News has apparently disappeared. After the Mount Gog incident, the people of Yulmore decided they needed a new leader, on account of the last one being a now dead Light Warden, but no one really wanted the job. So after a lot of whining and complaining, Chai News got picked as the new mayor, which he is a perfect choice for, but not long after he was picked, he disappeared. But Chai News isn't really one to run away from his responsibilities. He'll complain, a lot, but he's not gonna just run away especially without his wife. There has to be another reason he's gone, and you and Alphano promise to find out what it is, which is enough to put Dulia Chai at ease. With a little bit of questioning, you find that Chai News has been going around the city talking to people about different ways to improve Yulmore, like by letting people outside of the city pay to visit the honeybee and stuff. After chatting with a few people, he apparently left the city, which likely means he went to talk to some of the people in the nearby settlements around Yulmore, so you, Alphano, and Kaishir head out to search for him. You find him in one of the outer villages, and he can't understand why any of you were wondering where he was since he did leave a note for his wife. And nothing in that letter said he was taking the job as mayor, not until he's gotten together the resources needed to solve the city's problems. In his conversations with the people, he's found some people who are willing to help with the issues of Yulmore, but there's one person whose assistance he needs if he's going to become a true mayor, at least in his mind, because honestly the things he's been doing to prepare for the job prove he's the perfect person for the job. But if he feels he needs to convince someone else of his worth, then you and Alphano are more than willing to vouch for Chai News' character. The man who he needs is named Rendon, and he had been the chief advisor to Vothry's father. 
He was a man with as much authority as Ranjit, so he has plenty of experience with what it takes to run a city. His help would be useful, but he could be crazy, so it might be better to ask around to find out more about the man before deciding to try and get him to help you run the city. Crystal overheard your conversation because it's not like you guys were whispering, and he doesn't really have a grudge against you more or the Chai's anymore, so he'll gladly help you guys out with Rendon. He's a more forgiving man than me because after trying to get me killed, there's not a chance that I'd ever have helped the people in Yulmore. Rendon is a man who has principles and no patience for anyone he thinks is half doing things. The fact that Chai News is trying to fix Yulmore works in his favor, but the fact that he feels guilty over what the city did under his previous leadership will make him a less effective leader than he could be, so Rendon likely won't work with him. The fact that he's not all that assertive doesn't help him either. Nobody follows leaders who aren't sure of themselves. Even if you turn out to be wrong, a good leader has to approach every situation with confidence. That's likely what Rendon wants to see. The man's not far away, so Tristel recommends that when Chai News goes to talk to him, he has to radiate confidence. After introducing Rendon to you, something that doesn't impress the man in the least, Chai News gives a speech about how to make the city better and such, and while it all sounds good, it's not enough. Rendon spent years writing laws and giving advice to his superiors about how to make a city where everyone benefited, but Vothry wasn't interested in anything but controlling people, so Rendon left. His convictions had made him abandon the city, but since Chai News stayed there, that means he approved of what Vothry did and how he led. That makes Rendon wonder just what type of nation Chai News plans on making. Chai News isn't Vothry, and he doesn't want to be. He knows why people came to Yulmore in the first place. They wanted safety and prosperity, and the first thing he plans on doing is making sure that the city's resources are actually spread out to the people equally like they should have been in the first place. There will no longer be any free or bonded citizens in his new Yulmore. He's going to establish trade with the nearby settlements and expand to other nations of North Ramp to help the city become a truly prosperous place for everyone. Which all sounds good, but Chai admits that he's a businessman, not a king, so he needs someone with nation running experience to help him out. He needs Rendon. The man likes the stuff that Chai is saying, but he needs to see some proof that the man can perform the duties of his office. He has to solve one major problem on his own, and that will prove he can, with the right team, be a competent leader. And the problem Rendon wants Chai to solve is the lack of food in the city. Since people are no longer eating the old, there's a bit of a food shortage. Rendon wants to know how Chai News plans on dealing with that. He's actually put a lot of thought into that problem. At the moment, Yulmore has enough money to buy food from their neighbors, which will give them time to address the fact that the city has done nothing in the realm of agriculture. They have to repopulate the villages that used to grow food and get them up and running again. That of course means relations have to be restored between neighbor and settlements, and some people have to be willing to leave Yulmore to work the farms. The research he's done in crafting his plan impresses Rendon, but if he wants to motivate the people, he'll need more than just a plan. He has to give them the means to rebuild. And for that, Chai falls back on what he knows best, the Talos. He doesn't have time to build them from scratch, but there are plenty of abandoned Talos wandering around Kalusia. I'm sure quite a few of them have tried to kill you once or twice. But with the right tools, they can be deactivated. He has the tools for it, which will let him turn them off without breaking them. Under normal circumstances, he would get you to do it, but he feels that the people need to learn to stand on their own feet, so he's going to do it himself. He does want you to make sure that none of the other creatures in the area eat him while he's working though. Not only does he take down the Talos without getting stepped on, he reprograms three of them to do his bidding, something that impresses Rendon enough to where the man actually would be honored to work with him. So you all return to Yulmore where Chai News gets to work on his plans, although the sight of three giant Talos heading toward the city in a single file line does scare the people a little bit. However, Dooley is just happy to see her husband back and she squeezes him until he passes out, which is not the best way to start his new job. With that done, Chai News gives an incredible speech that motivates the people to work hard for Yulmore to become a united place, free from the stain that Vothry put on it. And the people all seem to be on board. He immediately goes to work, which means it's time for you and Alphino to head out so you can get back to working on more important things, like getting the Scions home. Back at the Crystarium, the news has already reached the Exarch about the new mayor of Yulmore. But in other news, after talking to Beck Luke, Ishtola and Urianje realize that White Aurasite won't actually work for the soul transfer, since making the souls eat their dormant would also destroy their minds. They could put their minds into the Aurasite instead, but that would destroy their souls. Since that idea is a bust, they've all been working on finding a way to send their minds and souls together. 
The Exarch actually has a bit of knowledge in that area since Unai and Doga were able to transfer their Allegan Eye to him, which allows him to link his mind to the Crystal Tower. That all happened a long time ago during your trip into the Crystal Tower, which I've already covered on this channel. But if they can learn how the Allegan technology worked, then that may be the key to transferring the mind and soul together. They're basically trying to make a soul crystal that holds both the memories and the soul of a person. While they work on that, Estola wants you to go back to the source and tell Kral and the others the plan, and to see if they have any ideas that could help speed things up. Back on the source, while you discuss things with the Scions, things start to go insane in Garlemald. With the death of the Emperor, civil war erupts throughout the nation as various factions fight to take over. Xenos is watching the chaos without all that much interest when an Asian that he doesn't know comes up to him. The Asian isn't unsundered, but he knows that Xenos is planning on hunting Zodiac, and he wants to help. That's not the only strange thing that happens. Back in Yulemore, in the midst of the people working to restore the city, Ardbert, fully alive, body and all, comes walking into the city. And that's where we're going to stop for today. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, subscribe, and ding that notification bell. And if you want to buy me a coffee for my work, sign up to become a member of the channel. Until next time guys, later.